Hey, what's up everybody? Trofinet here and welcome back to Gwent Edge. In this show we talk about specific Gwent cards or interesting decks to play around with. The Master Mirror expansion has settled in a little bit by now. Hell, we even got our first balance update already. But Syndicate is considered by many to be the worst faction at the moment. Weird then that I have been able to ladder from rank 6 to 3 in just a few hours with my new Congregate deck, New Religion. A deck focused on spawning lots of priests, so hide your children, and generating a potentially unlimited amount of points on the board. Before we dive any deeper, you can check out the deck composition on screen right now, and you can also find this deck and the guide on the Play Gwent website. The link is in the description down below. With that said, let's go over the different cards and how to use them. The spawning archetype in Syndicate isn't new. Here in Gwent Edge we even covered a similar deck last year, so you'll see a lot of the same tactics return here, but the extra support that the new Master Mirror cards provide turned this from an occasionally strong gimmick to a fully fledged powerhouse. As stated before, this deck focuses on spawning a lot of units on the board quickly and benefiting from the spawns at the same time. To do this we have three specific cards available the old Firesworn Scribe and Townsfall cards, and the new Fallen Knight card. The latter is the most straightforward benefactor. The Fallen Knight has Veil and Intimidate, and boosts itself by the amount of units you spawn every time you spawn any units. In this deck, it allows the Fallen Knight to easily gain 20 points or more in a single round. The Firesworn Scribe has a more indirect effect, generating a single coin every time you spawn units, regardless of the amount of units spawned. He also needs to be on the range row for his ability to work. Lastly, we have the Townsfolk, which boost themselves by one every time you gain coins, which is why they work great in combination with the Scribe. They will boost themselves every time the Firesworn Scribe is triggered, and all three of these cards are very powerful support cards in their own right. But, if you have one of each of these cards on the board, you automatically generate at least 3 points every time you spawn a unit. Which happens quite a lot in this deck. Which brings us right to our spawning engines. This deck includes multiple ways to continuously spawn Firesworn Zealots or the new Flaming Rose Footman on the board. The Eternal Fire Disciple, for example, allows you to spawn a Zealot once every turn for 2 coins, and is your basic bronze spawn engine. Congregation allows you to spawn two or three zealots on a row at once, depending on whether there was already a firesworn unit on that row. Congregation is also a good example to clear up the difference between the firesworn scribes effect and the fallen knights effect. Playing congregation with the scribe on the field will generate one coin, regardless of whether you spawn two or three zealots. You only have one spawn event, so you only get one coin. Fallen Knight does factor in the amount of units you spawn, and will boost himself by 2 or 3, matching the amounts of zealots you spawn. The new Cleric of the Flaming Rose card can also spawn a single zealot for 2 coins when played, but also has the ability to transform zealots into base, 3 power, 1 armor, Flaming Rose footmen for a single coin, possibly boosting them by 2 in the process if they were already damaged to 1 power. Lieutenant von Herst has the same ability and will also automatically spawn a zealot on his row for free at the end of your turn if you have 5 coins stored. This makes him the only automatic priest generator in this deck, which can generate a lot of points if combined with any of our passive setup cards. Lastly, we have two big hitters in the spawning area. Grand Inquisitor Helvede gives you 4 coins when played and also allows you to spawn zealots for 2 coins each. Compared to the Disciple, however, he does not have a cooldown and can therefore keep spawning zealots as long as you have space on the row and can afford it. Combine him with one or more scribes and you can fill a row with these, since you will only need one coin or even no coins at all, or even gain coins starting from three scribes, which is really really cool. Filling a row is of course a problem, but it can be remedied by another new card. More on that in a minute. Finally, we have Igor the Hook. Igor can spawn a copy of a bronze ally on his row for five coins, or five of his power once per turn. This allows you to spawn a copy of any of your passive engines, the Scribes, Fallen Knight or Townsfolk, every single turn as long as you can afford it. 
If you start by copying the scribes, you make the next use of Igor cheaper and cheaper since you gain more coins for each pawn because of the scribes. More coins also means more boosts on the townsfolk and more spawns means more points on the fallen knights. The longer Igor stays alive, the wilder the board state actually gets, reaching insane heights by the end of the round, which is why you should keep Igor for that final round. To support all this wild spawning, we have some really good new cards as well. The Lonely Champion is probably the best addition by far, which is surprising for a 4 provision bronze. Lonely Champion destroys all Firesworn tokens, so both Zealots and Footmen alike, and boosts itself by their combined power. He also has immunity, so cannot be targeted directly. Since you don't gain extra points aside from his 4 base power, he seems kinda useless at first glance, but he really, really shines in this deck. See, Firesworn Swarms had the problem that you could fill up your board really, really quickly. So quickly that you locked up your own board before you played every one of your cards. Lonely Champion remedies this by possibly clearing an entire row, making space for a whole new regiment of Zealots and all that benefits that brings. Dies Irai is also a very good addition to this deck. Its name is actually Latin for the Days of Rage, and as an Echo Crime card it can be reused once every match since it will be put back on top of your deck at the end of the round it was played in. Using it allows you to damage an enemy unit by 3, and then boosting all your Firesworn units by 1. If you manage to kill a unit with the initial damage, it will boost all of your units by 1, so not only the Firesworn units. Since you often have an almost full board, this can generate up to 21 points in one go. A very effective finisher, which you can use twice if needed, so don't be afraid to use it to end round 1 in your favor if you need to. Ulrich is also a very nice support unit, allowing you to spawn and play a copy of a bronze unit from your hand and boost it by 2 if devotion is met, which this deck does. This can help in setting up an extra engine like the Scribes, Townfolk or Fallen Knight with a bit more protection since he gains a boost of 2. He also has Intimidate, so he will be boosted by 1 for every crime card you play. Roderick de Wet is a great passive unit who generates a single coin at the end of your turn as long as you didn't use his order ability, which you can use to spawn a Flaming Rose Footman. Combine him with a Townsfolk and you'll have a nice little engine loop, providing you with extra coins and boosts without too much effort. Finally, we have the Syndicate Evolving card, Jacques de Aldersberg himself. In his final form, he gives you 4 coins and the option to spend them immediately to spawn 2 Flaming Rose Footmen for 12 points in total. The coins and spawns can both trigger your engine cards, so that can ramp up even quicker depending on your board state. On top of that, he has Veil and will boost himself by 1 every time you play a Firesworn card, Crimes included. He's a very strong card who gains the most potential if you play him right after your setup cards, so you benefit from both the spawns and the Firesworn cards you play later. Offensively, this deck is pretty limited however. Aside from the 3 damage from Dies Irai, you have Tavern Brawl, which can be used to force two adjacent enemy units to duel, potentially taking out a higher power unit, and Tin Boy, on the other hand, can be used to counter opposing swarms by damaging all units on a row by two, or all enemy units at all if you have 8 coins left to spend. Definitely still a very strong finisher against certain opponents, but you need to remember to spend those 8 coins elsewhere if your opponent hasn't filled both rows enough. Thin Boy wouldn't be worth it otherwise. So with all of that, let's look at an example match to get a feel for how to play this deck. We'll not just take any opponent, um, today in today's example match we face a monsters deck with Fruits of Isgit and the new Ethereal card, basically making this an archetype mirror since they will also try to swarm the board. Ethereal is very very strong at the moment, so I feel like this is a good example to use. Mulligan wise, I always try to keep as many golds in my hand of course, also at least one way to continuously spawn units and one of each setup card if possible, so that's either Townsfolk, Fallen Knight and the Firesworn Scribe. In the first round we get two out of the three, but also get Roderick who is really really strong in combination with the Townsfolk. Monsters like to go big, so we start strong as well with Ulrich and a Fallen Knight. Our opponent goes for the obvious Thrive play, so we try to plan ahead. Roderick goes up next, 
who starts generating coins in the background. We follow up with the townsfolk who now continuously boost themselves because of the coins from Roderick. Our next few plays are pretty straightforward. We have two congregations and both Ulrich and the Fallen Knight have Intimidate. Aside from spawning two zealots each time, they also generate 5 points in total on these cards for 11 points per congregation played. Not bad for uh, 4 provisions. Our opponent keeps playing big units, however, so even with the 12 points from Procession of Penance, we only barely are able to keep up. At this point, I decide to push, however. We still have some pretty strong cards, so I feel like we can take the round on Red Coin, which would be very, very nice. We spawn Roderick's Flaming Rose Footman and play Dies Irai for a nice 15 points. Next up is our opponent's Wygern, which we promptly take out with Tavern Brawl, also damaging the beast next to it pretty severely for 18 damage in total and 2 more points on Ulrich and the Fallen Knight. Our opponent still doesn't back down but underplays, allowing me to pass into card advantage. Round 2 goes by fast. I look for a simple card to play that also provides me with some coins that might carry over into round 3, which we find in the Eternal Fire Disciple, giving us an extra 2 coins. We also draw Jack here, who will come in handy in round 3. Round 3 itself is also very generous, providing us with a Scribe, Excommunication, which is great to pull an extra card, and Grand Inquisitor Helveed, our big boy priest generator. I'd say we're good to go. Setup is similar to round 1. We play the Fallen Knight and the Firesworn Scribe while our opponent expectedly plays the Ethereal, pulling it with Omeromancy. Our opponent will try to focus on their swarm while we work on ours, which we promptly do by spawning two zealots with our leader ability, generating extra points on the Fallen Knight for each and two coins because of the Scribe. Next up is Jacques, spawning two more units and just as many points and coins while our opponent plays the Haunt scenario, indicating that we probably won't be expecting much removal, ideal for our current play. We get pretty unlucky with Excommunication, which we use to draw the Cleric, giving us at least the ability to turn Salads into Footmen if we need to. After some serious death wish setup from our opponent, we play Big Boy Helveed and fill up his row with zealots up to 7 units, transforming a few of them as we see fit. It's always important to remember to not fill up your rows completely, since they could be filled by your opponent if they have for example movement abilities or spies to block you from spawning more or using the Lonely Champion. Again. The Lonely Champion can remedy this, but we don't have any in our hand at the moment, so we need to be careful. We only have one more unit in our hand though, so we fill up the board as much as possible before playing DA's Eli again, this time for a total of 22 points because of the Intimidate on the board. Thin Boy is used to finish up by hitting all the Ethereals with 2 damage for another 18 point play, giving us the game with a nice 36 point lead. It's important to note that even without the card advantage in the final round, we would have won this match with ease. That is how strong this swarm can get. To conclude, this deck can outpace any swarm deck of the other factions with ease, as long as at least some setup cards stay on the board. Because of this, the automatic weakness this deck has is Skellige, since its relentless assault can easily take out any engine cards you put on the board, while also benefiting from the carnage at the same time. Even your high power engines are at risk here, as this very painful 100 point Morgvark swing demonstrates. There's not much you can do about that, aside from maybe swapping Ulrik for um, Ulrik and a lower card for Azar Javed and Kalkstein, so you have both a Defender and a Purify option to counter Rupture, which this deck lacks at the moment. Experimentation is always encouraged, but I'm just really glad that Firesworn Swarms have finally reached their full potential. And that's it for today. What do you think about the new religion deck? Got any ideas on how to improve it or any new ways to outthink your opponent? Don't hesitate to leave advice in the comment section down below so we can help each other out. That's what we're here for after all. If you're aching for more, I have several older deck guides that are still valid, such as the Squirtel Movement deck and a Blaze of Glory Skellige deck. And if you're looking for something a little bit different, you can check out my Art Secret in Gwent videos or any of my broader analysis videos like the one I just recently did on the Master Mirror expansion. Any feedback on any of these videos is greatly appreciated, so uh, 
check me out on Twitter if you want to talk. That's at TrophyNut, so T-R-O-V-N-U-T. And if you enjoyed this video, why not give it a like? Any support is greatly appreciated. Thanks enormously for watching, and I hope to see you guys in the next episode of Grand Pitch. Goodbye.